Welcome to the Intentional Encourager podcast, where each episode brings you compelling conversations and stories designed to entertain, enlighten, and encourage. And now here's your host, Brian Sexton. And welcome into the Intentional Encourager podcast. I'm your host, Brian Sexton. Thank you for joining us again today. And this is a, an especially fun podcast for me to record because I have someone that lives not far from me here in the almost heaven WV. And so there are a bunch of us out there. And so Kimberly and I got connected on LinkedIn and we didn't realize how close we live to each other, about 30 minutes away. And so she is the host of the Cannoli Coach podcast. We're going to get into that. And she is also a leadership development grow and growth coach and trainer. If I could talk to today, it'd be okay. <laughs> but uh, you can find her on LinkedIn at Kimberly Hambrick, H A M B R I C K. But you can find her right now on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Kimberly, how are you today? Hey, I am awesome. And I am so excited to have this conversation. And as you said, I know when. I got connected with you on LinkedIn. It was through one of our joint connections that you were doing a podcast. And I'm like, dude, look how close we live. Had we be, been able to go out and, you know, visit, maybe we would have run into each other at some point. But here we are today. And I'm honored and privileged to have the conversation with you and your listeners. I think we should sing Country Roads. <laughs> I really do. I think we should just almost heaven. But, but that's for the school up north. Yeah, that I that I didn't go to and and don't particularly care for. I like uh, the school oh, to the west. You're always already picking a fight. I I, I know. Mean, I went to the uh, school. I went to little brother about <laughs> you know about 35 minutes west from you and about 20 minutes west of here. That well, that well, is I the have, green and white. Yeah, I have degrees from both. Uh, so I I am a W. Well, look grad. at you, bragger. You got two degrees in, well, I, and you I, live I, in I, West Virginia. See that makes you and I like the like the the one tenth of one percent of West Virginians. Well, if I could brag a little bit more, I have three. I'm actually a doctorate. I have a PhD, but um, my bachelor's is from WVU, and I'm so old that when I got my master's, it was um, West Virginia College of Graduate Studies, Cogs, and then yeah. all of a sudden Marshall, I Cogs. yeah. So then Marshall acquired, bought, or whatever, and I'm like. I'm a Marshall graduate. I'm a WVU graduate. I thought I'm a Marshall graduate. So I bleed blue and gold, green and white, and it's all good. It's well, all good. you see, yellow and blue make green anyway. So it's oh. you know that's what I tell my that's what I tell my WVU friends. I'm like, look, guys, you mix you, you mix blue and gold, you get green. So you know that's you just might as well just roll with it. But yeah, we I was never bold enough or brave enough to when I got my MBA about ten years ago. People said, oh, you're going to go forward. I'm like, why? At the time, I was 37. I was like, I think I'm good. I think I'll just yeah. hang with the NBA and, and just, just, be, just be there. But, yeah, and we tease because a lot of people make fun of our state mm -hmm. because we're typically down near the bottom in education. Now, you know, now I don't know about Kimberly, whether she has shoes on or not, but most of the time – the thing with West Virginia is leave your shoes at the border. Um, I'm not married to my cousin. So the West Virginia jokes that you might make about us, you know, for this conversation, keep those to yourself. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to encourage you today. But we are West Virginians. We're proud West Virginians. And it is so good to have you. Yeah, and we are. And I just want to chime in on that because in my corporate career, I would do a lot of national travel. And I would show up and people would start with the jokes from West Virginia. And, and I would be talking to people from Texas and North Carolina, Louisiana. We all have our ups and downs. Um, the fact that I never got, <laughs> you know, run out of town in Mississippi one time when I was doing a training is very impressive to me because I was doing this training, a training that I knew like the back of my hand, but the U.S. Department of Education had changed. Um, what they were calling something. So every time I came to that word, I kind of did a stutter stop. And all of a sudden I heard one of the teachers at the front table say, that's why we always say, thank God for West Virginia. I forgot that I was miked. And I said, really? In West Virginia, we always say, thank God for Mississippi. And I saw <laughs> 
500 sets of eyes all stare at me. And all I will say, Brian, is thank God for my delivery because they all laughed at me then. <laughs> well, here's what I say to people from other states. I'm like, listen, you guys have crazy relatives too. You just don't talk about them. Like we yeah, We just put ours on the front porch. <laughs> absolutely. Or, or they're dancing outlaws. One of the two, they, you know, oh. you, you never know what you're going to, but, but, you know, I was, I was talking to a, a gentleman from Point Pleasant, his name, and, and it's on my recent podcast, Donnie Jones. He's now the head coach of the Stetson University Hatters, but he was mm -hmm. at Florida for a while at Marshall and UCF. In, in West Virginia, where we live, Kimberly, we have a lot of great people mm -hmm. from West Virginia. If you watch any kind of network television right now, you will see a West Virginian in Jennifer Garner who is doing big, big things, doing commercials and movies. And she's from, she's from Charleston. Yeah. Steve Harvey's from Welch. Steve Harvey's from Welch. Yeah. Jerry West, the, the NBA logo is from Cabin Creek. Mm -hmm. um, the Dan Tonys from, from Mullins. Oh yeah. Great you know, family. And, yeah. Great family. And so again, you know, there is, there are a lot of people, Don Knotts, the legendary comedian was from Morgantown. That's probably the only good thing that's come out of Morgantown, but you know. <laughs> Ouch! Ouch! <laughs> no, Bob Huggins, Bob Huggins, the the head coach. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I, I, I like Morgantown. I, I was born in Star City, which is technically right by Morgantown. I, I will tell you though, even though I am very proud of where I've lived, I've lived here my whole life. I love this state. It has its ups and downs, just like yeah. any state. You can create the life you want here, which I think is a misnomer and a lot of people don't understand that. But I remember when my oldest was going to college um, up on 79 and I said, we'll take the Star City exit. And he's like in, you know, um, Mount Morris. He's like, there's no Star City exit. I'm like, what are you talking about? They renamed the Star City Exit to West Virginia University, and I was really upset about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right, because for years you would go there. Star City, the, the Star City Exit was definitely the way you wanted to access the Coliseum if you were going to a basketball game, or you could backdoor into Mountaineer Field that way. There is a really good Texas Roadhouse there at Star City. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, but we could we could talk all day long about what here's what I will say about our state what I love about when I leave West Virginia and come back I say thank God we don't have the traffic problems you other people have amen amen I you know yeah. yeah I can go to the mall and it's eight minutes from my house mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about traffic I go where I want to I'm always yeah. amazed by that Kimberly because you know we just don't have a lot of the issues that people have in bigger cities and we've got the mountain this time of year that, that we're recording this podcast west virginia is absolutely the spot you want to come to mm -hmm. our weather's good and if you take a drive up i-79 you are going to see some of the most beautiful foliage that you'll ever lay eyes on yeah and and to be honest we're also a state predominantly of people who love and support each other and you know the world today is going a little bit crazy um, in a lot of ways, but you don't get that here. You get people who accept and recognize the differences. One of the um, one of the most one of, one of the books that I've been reading a lot lately is by Miles McPherson, The Third Option. I don't know if you've read that, but I would highly recommend that you read it. He is he used to play for the Chargers. So my one son thought when I said, "Hey, do you know Miles McPherson?" and he said, "Yeah, he played for the Chargers." I'm like, "Look how cool I am." Um, yeah. But what he talks about with the third option is it's always going to be an us versus them conversation. So right now, you and I, we've got male versus female. We've got Marshall versus WBU. We always have an us versus them. But if you start with where the commonality is, and if you respect where the commonality is, then you can have any uncomfortable, difficult conversation. And that's really something that I've held on to throughout this year uh, in terms of COVID conversations, the, the racial tensions, and we're, we're slowly moving to election day where, um, you know, families are divided. Friendships mm -hmm. are lost over this. And it's just a very unfortunate, but I will say predominantly in our state, I, I feel like there's, there's this underlying love for each other and respect. 
Well, and I'm glad you said that, Kimberly. So let's let's go there for a minute to what you do best and what you know best, and that's leadership and growth and, and people development. Great leaders have the ability to find common ground. Mm-hmm. Every great leader has the ability to find common ground. And if you want to go from a good leader to a great leader, you better learn where common ground is where you're, with your people. You need to learn where that skill is. And I said this this morning, I was doing live radio, and I said, I could take any one of the presidential candidates or VP candidates, sit them next to me here, and whether I disagree with them politically, fundamentally, or whatever, we could find an area of common ground with something. We could find something to talk about that we, that we may, and I may not like them politically at all. I may go, my goodness, my, my head hurts with how you are politically, Mm -hmm. but we can, we can find some form of common ground to have a conversation when when you think about it from a leadership standpoint why do leaders struggle finding common ground with their people well um a lot of times and part of the reason why i do what i do brian to be perfectly honest is a lot of times people are elevated into a leadership position either based by tenure how long they've been in the organization. And if there's an opening, uh, a lot of times you'll hear, well, you know, Brian's been here 15, 20 years. It's his time. Or Brian was a great salesperson. And so, yeah, he must naturally be a leader, be a great sales leader. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, a lot of times we put people in positions that uh, they're not ready for it. They may not even want, and then we do a really, bad job. Organizations consistently do a bad job of developing those leaders. So that's part of it, that you you have a wrong fit. Another one is that a lot of leaders focus on positional leadership. And so I'm the leader, hear what I say, move forward with me. And and that's kind of what they do. And that's a problem as well. But Mm -hmm. what I've really noticed, and I'm just going to kind of tack into because everyone's been I mean 2020 is 2020 well let's not even have to talk about it right now but one of the things that I've really noticed in leaders and what makes a great leader in terms of this common ground is the first thing that they did is they focused on their people over their profits and where they found common ground and this is something that I've talked about a lot and I firmly believe it and I do it as well we're all in the same storm but it's impacting us differently. So a leader who takes that time to acknowledge that, have a conversation with his or her employees, and it's a very simple question. How are you doing, really? And then you Mm -hmm. listen. And what that does and what I've seen is that it's just made that common ground more solid, and it gave more credibility to that leader who, in a difficult time, rose to the occasion because one of the things that you can say about a crisis is it doesn't define you. A crisis doesn't make you a leader. A crisis refines what you were already. And for some we're seeing that wasn't that good to begin with. Well, and here's the thing too that I'll say is my friend Kristen Sherry has said this to me before. She has said people don't leave companies. They leave leaders. Absolutely. And that's so true because you can find where people will say, um, I'm, I'm leaving for this reason or I'm leaving for that reason. And then ultimately what you find out is they left because you were not a good leader. Yeah. And so when, when you think about that, Kimberly, what, can, what do you think leaders, what's the number one skill that a leader can constantly be working on to make themselves better? You know, um, I, I think for me, one of them, I, I don't know if it's the number one, but it's an important one. One is realizing what brought you there won't keep you there. Mm-hmm. And so, so you have to look at your team and you have to realize, and this is something I think a lot of leaders don't do a very good job of. They're not very comfortable identifying his or her blind spots or their weaknesses and recognizing that somebody on their team may have a better idea. So you have to have some humility there. And if you as a leader, if you you have humility and you could go to your team and say, listen, 
I don't know what to do about this. I mean, I actually mm -hmm. said this to a team that I'm overseeing when everything happened. I'm like, I don't know how to lead through this. Nobody knows how to lead through COVID-19 or something like this. What can I do to help you? And how can you help me be a better leader? Now, a lot of people won't have that conversation because right then and there, you know, you kind of peek behind the curtain at the Wizard of Oz. But if a leader is not humble enough, so you have to have humility, you have to have integrity, communication is key. So many times we get talked at by a leader instead mm -hmm. of a leader talking with us. So those yeah, are a that's couple so things true. that bubble up. Yeah. And, and you know, Kimberly, that's the thing is a lot of times some leaders will be like parents. Okay. I have a I my wife and I have a 20-year-old son. And a leader will will basically have the philosophy of do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. And for me, as a, as a dad, I've had to have those conversations with my son and say, you know what, that's not fair. Because I can't say, you got to do this. And then meanwhile, I, I do this. And, well, it's because I'm dad, you know. The accountability should always be with me to set the example as the leader and to always be the one doing the leading instead of going, well, it's just the way we've always done it, or corporate says we have to do it that way. Yeah. You really can set the tone as a leader. When you think about COVID, and we've talked about COVID and things like that, how do you see leadership changing from the pandemic as now we've had to manage and lead people remotely mm -hmm. instead of face-to-face? -face. So how do you see leadership development and growth changing as a result of the pandemic? Oh, thank you for asking that because I, I will tell you back in March when things were slowly starting to shut down and I would have so many conversations with different leaders who were like, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how they're going to do the work. And then you go fast forward a couple of months and I always ask the same question. How's the work going? Well, the work's going great. Have any targets been missed? No. How, are, are the staff rising up? They are. And so there was sort of like this old school mentality, if you will, that if I don't see you sitting in the office right next to me doing your work, you're not doing your work. And, and I'm a prime example of this. Um, early in my career with one company that I worked with in West Virginia, they were opening an office in Arlington, Virginia. We did a lot of educational work through the U.S. Department of Ed. Mm -hmm. And so they were moving the office, part of the team there. Well, I was connected to that team, but I wasn't moving. I had two small children. Um, I wasn't going to move. So I was the first employee for this company to telecommute, if you will, working from home. I, I wrote a guidebook. I wrote the policy for it. And I will never forget being parts of conversations back before video, just conference call. And people would always say, you know, where's Kimberly? And I'm like, you know, on the phone, I'm here. They can't, one woman actually sat on the phone one time during the meeting. And it was just like, I had no idea what was going on. But there was this leader, wasn't my boss, that really had a problem not seeing me. Mm -hmm. So I remember going into the office one day and I knocked on her door and I knocked on her door for one uh, intentional reason because she was playing solitaire on her computer. So my knock allowed her time to shut down her game. And I asked her how she was doing. And I said, so let's just say her name was, um, I'll just use you. So I'll just say, hey, Brian, um, what's Kimberly doing? So I'm your employee. And I sit in the office next to you. And, and he said, I have no idea what she's doing. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's working right next to you. Don't you know what she's doing? I'm like, absolutely not. And I'm like, what am I doing? And this person rattled off everything I was doing because I was sending emails to the whole leadership team. Here's what I'm going to work on at the beginning of the week. Here's what I did at the end of the week. Proximity, a butt in a seat in an office, does not make an effective employee. So I think what we're seeing is that mindset shifting, that people mm -hmm. can do their business from anywhere if you give them the right resources. Um, I, I think there is something different about learning how to lead virtually than leading in person because you can have a meeting and and you kind of walk in tell people what you want them to learn you know here do as i say and then you leave and some people are struggling with having having a meeting and taking the first five or ten minutes just to catch up and see how people are mm -hmm. and you start to see the people who 
for lack of a better way to say it, don't want to be bothered. Well, yeah, I, it's, and, it's, and it's because here's the thing. Basic human decorum exists, <laughs> whether it's virtual or in person. We, I, I've been in meetings recently, and people don't even do the simple thing of muting yeah. their line. And I, and I heard someone in a meeting recently going, oh, I'm on a dumb national call. And, and it's like, why in the world? It, it's like, and I'll say it this way. We've seen broadcasters get in trouble mm -hmm. because of saying things that were caught. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, political candidates on a hot mic. A hot mic. Exactly. <laughs> and you and I both, you, you, you with the Cannoli Coach podcast and me with the Intentional Encourager podcast, you have to understand that it's a live mic. Yeah. You say that, and, and the phone will ring and things will happen. Listen, those things happen. But it's not me saying, oh my gosh, Kimberly's rambling so long. You know, can't believe she just said it. Yeah, but your face is saying that. To well, me no, right but now. you <laughs> have to, yeah, Kimberly, you, you need to have that decorum to know that whether you're on a conference call or on a Zoom, just have some basic decorum. Yeah, yeah, I, and, I agree. and know how to act. Yeah, you, you, you know, you call it decorum, which I agree with. I, I started 2020 before everything went to heck in a handbasket with the mantra "just be kind." We stopped mm -hmm. being kind to one another, and and now we're all in this, you know, cesspool, if you will, and <laughs> we forgot how to be kind. But mm -hmm. it's such simple things. It's it's knowing that. Well, how did I hear it recently? I heard it recently um, that if you're in a conversation, and especially from a leadership perspective, it's more important from a leadership perspective that you appear interested in your team yes. and those you're talking to than being interesting. Um, I, I was connected with somebody one time that I did some work with and every conversation, this person was a leadership junkie, would read so many different books and would always talk about, you know, great leaders do X. I'm a great leader because I do X. And it just got to be a joke. Yeah. Um, and, and so stop trying to make yourself interesting and take some time to be interested in the people that you're leading and the people that you're talking to. It'll make a world of difference, I promise. If you're too busy patting yourself on the back, you're doing the wrong thing with your arm. Absolutely. It, it, it takes, it, it's better to have your hand extended to someone than to have your hand behind you patting yourself on the back. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. And, and Kimberly, I love what you said there too. I think a lot of people with social media think, well, I have to post this. I have to say this. That's where we have fallen into the, to the cesspool, as you just said, because it's like grandma's old saying goes, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, don't say it at all. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, social media, I've, I've heard it. Uh, we had mentioned Steve Harvey. I was connected with a group where he was on a presentation. And so he calls them um, thumb gangsters, the people, which I thought was hilarious, people on social <laughs> media. I, I've heard it as uh, uh, keyboard cowboys. The words, yeah. yeah, the reality is you can sit wherever you are and you could spew, <laughs> and that is the word I want to use, yeah. spew hatred and have no consequences. And so if, if you wouldn't say it to a person's face, mm -hmm. why is it okay to say it, um, you know, in, in, uh, on social media? And, and I live by this. I mean, there are a few things that I've always lived by in my life. One is... I won't say anything behind your back that I wouldn't say to your face. Now, Brian, and I say this as well, I've squirmed a couple times mm -hmm. in saying something to somebody's face. Not that it was hurtful or mean, but it was a bit brutal. How's because, it going to be received? Yeah, yeah. because sometimes uh, honesty may not be received well. And, and I live by that. And mm -hmm. I've had experiences in my life that um, my bachelor's is in public relations, and so I actually worked as a newspaper reporter up for the Dominion Post in Morgantown for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Actually had to vet, recheck, double check, triple check anything that I wrote and got printed. Mm -hmm. 
that's not, not the case anymore. We're, we're not in that at all. You know, there was a personal situation at one point in my life where, I mean, I would be listening to something and then getting in the car and hearing something on the radio. And I'm like, were we in the same room? Yeah. <laughs> well, and let's, I want to part, I want to finish that thought and then pivot to your story. Cause I, I'm now I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about you. And that's why I wanted to have you on, but there's two things that I, that I would say there. Number one is anything you say can and will be used against you. I always wow. told my salespeople that because the people that I managed, I said, listen, anything you say can and will be used against you because customers are the most sensitive mechanism in the world. You can say anything and they'll go, okay, well, my salesperson told me this or my salesperson told me that. The second thing I would say is everybody's watching. Mm -hmm. So what you post on social media lives long after you've posted it. So you don't know that if you're going to change careers or change companies, that a recruiter might not be out there looking and going, you know, what you posted on Facebook, you know, we, we, we kind of scouted you out on Facebook or on LinkedIn or on Twitter. And you know what, when you were mean and nasty and vile to somebody, you know, colleges are doing that today with students. Mm. They're yeah, pulling it, back admissions because of what kids say and they're learning hard lessons because what you say lives well past the moment you said it. Yeah, and, and this is something, I was just part of a conversation earlier this week or last week, uh, I can't remember, uh, around this. And, and to be perfectly honest, that's a fine line in my opinion because I feel like we do have a personal side. Mm -hmm. And I think we can be able to post. So, you know, a number of people, a number of high school students, college students are getting harassed or reprimanded because they have a different political view. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're saying something extremely negative and hurtful, that's one thing. But if they're just saying something that, you know, <laughs> I support this, I, I don't think it's fair that a judgment is placed against them. It, right. it, it's, it's this, are you expressing something that will add good to the universe. <laughs> Let's just call it the universe. It would add good, or are you just trying to tear somebody down? So, so I, I struggle with that one a little bit. I do understand what you're saying, and I try to be very careful and respectful, and I, and I have two grown children, and I tell them the same thing. And I work with uh, you know, emerging leaders, and I tell mm -hmm. them the same thing. But we've gone a little too far well here's the here's where i will here's why i will expand on that my credo on linkedin and my other social media platforms is this if i can't add value to a conversation i won't post or comment absolutely if i can't add something a different opinion or maybe something and i'll be perfectly honest there are times that i read posts to see if i can poke holes in the post mm -hmm. Because again, to your point, what we were talking about earlier about leadership experts and people that, that say, I will look for things from my experience and go, yeah, but in a real world application, you might consider this. Yeah. Well, and that's where yeah. the humility comes in, in terms of all of us, because I, um, I don't want people to always agree with me. Good Lord, if everybody's like me, we got a lot of problems. Um, well, Kimberly, iron sharpens iron, right? Exactly. And you know, what, what I say to people, and I've said this for years and years, I'm an acquired taste. Not everybody's going to like me or want to work same, with me. Same here, yeah. yeah. And, and, and to be honest, Brian, sometimes that's a little nicer than saying, oh, there's just some people I don't like. I, I put it on me. But or you have I'll, to self-medicate when you're around. Like with me, people are going, let me, let me self-medicate here before yeah. we have got Good Absolutely. <laughs> but, but, you know, I put things out there and, and I want people to have a conversation. So you, you, you said poke holes, poke holes, do it respectfully. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the only thing. And I, and I can't remember, there was somebody, uh, there was something recently that I posted and I was talking about um, body language and it was a person that had contacted me and was trying to sell me something. And so you and I can see each other. And so the whole time this person's talking to me, he's like, yeah, Brian, you know, I only work with the really um, committed people. I don't even waste my time. Well, you're not talking to me. You're talking at me. Well, and, that really, and that really turned me off. And I kind of posted about the importance of body language. And, and, and I had my eyes open. 
by a couple different people pushing back on me. Maybe someone wasn't comfortable with making eye contact. Maybe there was a reason for it. Wow. And, and, and so I'm open to that. And, and I try to be very respectful when people say, you know, I, I say, you know, thank you for giving me your insights. I need to think into that. So I, I have a mentor who says all the time, we're perfectly imperfect. And man, I love that one daily. Well, and, and again, I love where our conversation is going because again, I, I value eye contact. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to train my brain to make eye contact. And, and it's, it's so important to me that I think it differentiates me when I have interactions with people that I mm -hmm. make and keep eye contact. And the second thing I would say is this, when someone says I only work with committed people, my pushback to them would have been, well, why did you reach out to me? Exactly. Why did you reach out to me? If, if you only work with committed people, then I only hire people that are committed to, to adding value to me. That's, yeah. what, that's the way I would have pushed back and said, well, that's great. We're, we're on the same page because I only hire people that are committed to delivering me results and helping me do what they say they're going to do. And so, yeah, yeah. that's great. I want to spend a few minutes telling your story. Okay. Because you've got such a great story. And let's go and go back as far as you want to go from <laughs> point A to where you are now and just tell your story. To this audience. Yeah, uh, thank you. I will. And, and what I will say is that when, when you're a guest on my podcast, um, one of the key questions I always ask people is life-defining moments and to share one because I think it's those are the moments that define us. They make us stronger. Some were set to break us, but they haven't. Um, so, you know, the, the cliff notes of me, uh, Italian Catholic born in Morgantown, Star City, middle child, say what you will about all the stigma of a middle child, but most of my life, I was the mini version of my older sister. I mean, I can show you picture after, I'm, I'm dressed exactly like her. I mean, there was no differentiation. We were twins three years apart. And so I, at an early age, and I, I say my parents didn't mean it, but at an early age, I was the forgotten one. I didn't mm -hmm. matter. And so that kind of stayed with me. But how I battled against it is I became the good kid, the smart kid. I made great grades. I was always excelling and it still wasn't enough. And so I moved forward. I, I, I talk about limiting self-beliefs, and I moved forward with that, even though I was successful on the outside. On the inside, I was always butting up against a lid. So you were Jan. You were, you were your family's Jan Brady, right? <laughs> oh, ouch, yes. <laughs> Well, no, it's, it's Marsha, 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 you, you know, it's exactly, exactly right. And, but nobody knew it. It was so funny. Cause when I finally, what happened with me, Brian, is that, you know, there, there's this, a whole thinking about um, law of attraction, who you are is who you attract. And yeah. I started to realize that because I was so focused on making sure others saw my value because I didn't. I couldn't see in front of me <laughs> the people that were in my circle mm -hmm. that only liked me because they could put me down. They didn't see my value. And, and the reality is, you know, I, I've had interactions and conversations with one person that I used to work with. And every time we had a, a conversation, he would say, you know what your problem is? And then he would tell me what my problem was. Well, I didn't know I had a problem, but now, oh my God, I have a problem and I've just snowballed it. You know, I call it the BS swirl of belief system. I'm just cycling in well, it. Kimberly, the thing that, that, that bothers me sometimes is, and I'll tell my wife and son this, I'll say, listen, don't bring me a problem that you can't offer a solution. Yeah. Well, and I that's, was a problem there. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and Kimberly, I love what you said there. I love what you said there because I've been guilty. It took me a long time to figure that out. I would say, you know what your problem is, or you know what you need to do here? And I would, I would tell them the problem, but not offer a solution. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's, I understand. And, and it triggered when you said that. I love what you said there because the person that would do that, now it created a lot of self-doubt. How did you move past that in your well, life? Well, when I talk about it, so when I talk about life-defining moments, some of them are good, some of them are bad, and some are gut kicks. Some are just ones that, you know, if you think about a gut kick, um, <laughs> stop you. 
make you just uh, and, hit, and hit bottom. And I got to the point in my life where I started to realize that so many people were taking advantage of me, both personally and professionally. Um, and I deserve better. Mm -hmm. I, I, I deserve so much better. And once I had that realization, I knew that I needed to seek guidance and help because this happened in my late 40s, early 50s. So I had been living my whole life functioning as a very successful person with limiting self-beliefs. And it was time that I broke through that finally. So I'm connected with the John Maxwell teams. Uh, I, I knew who John was. I didn't know he had a team. I had been certified as a coach through International Coach Federation about four years prior to joining the John Maxwell team. Mm -hmm. I joined the John Maxwell team first and foremost to enhance my own leadership ability because I had been in leadership roles since the early 90s. And what I started to realize in sitting there and talking with some of the mentors, um, how broken I was. And, and, and I use that word very strategically because I was broken. One of... Um, one of the mentors, Mark Cole, who is now actually the CEO of the John Maxwell Enterprise, on my very first call with Mark, I, I, and you talk about things being recorded. I mean, these calls are recorded. Everybody could hear it. It was just me and Mark having a conversation. And I just told him what was going on in my life. And he said something so powerful to me. And the thing he said to me was, borrow the belief I have in you until your belief matches. And I have to tell you, Brian, that was eye-opening for me because I wow. never had somebody speak into me that way. So I realized that if I was going to attract people who valued me, I had to value myself first. And I did some really intensive, down and dirty work on my own belief system. And now I know I'm worth it. I know I'm mm -hmm. valued. And that is not, and I, when I say that, I feel it. And that's not where I was my whole life. I wore a mask. Do you feel like that moment, there are two ways that, that I could see that moment going. Either the first moment is, and, this, and I call this, Kimberly, I call it a V8 moment. Like, oh, wow, I didn't see that. Or the second moment is it's emotional and it breaks you. Where did you find yourself in that moment when you had that discussion with Mark? Did 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 the light bulb go off or was it, oh my, this is this is emotionally heavy? Uh, it was a little of both. And and that's what I say to people. Um, you know, you can be beaten down by so many people, sometimes unintentionally and sometimes <laughs> in your face intentional. Let's see. If well, we and let me, let me park, let me park there just a minute. I love, that is, that is powerful. That is really powerful because again, that's why we're doing the Intentional Encourager podcast is so there, you said it earlier and I love what you said there's a cesspool mm -hmm. and, and that's the appropriate word, a cesspool of negativity and, and things like that. And so it's swirling. You talk about the swirling BS and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and I hope that intentional encouragement is like a samurai sword mm -hmm. that just cuts through that because Kimberly, that's, that's the whole goal of what we're trying to do is to spread as much intentional encouragement as we can so people don't feel like you felt. And so people don't feel like, oh my gosh, if I could just get my head out of this cesspool, I could breathe, I could survive, I could do, that's why we're doing what we're doing. I had to jump in there because no, you I hit on something brilliant there. Yeah, well, th well, thank you. Anytime you want to call me brilliant, you go right ahead. But thank you for that. But um, I agree with you there. Because brilliant, 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 <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> no, it really was. It was, it was outstanding. Because again, I think you, you so very, you, 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 how we say here in West Virginia, you're hitting where we live. Because a lot of people are doing that very thing. 
they're feeling these things. They don't know how to, to express it. They don't know how to verbalize it. And they're dying for somebody to just encourage them. Yeah, I, I so agree. And, I, and, and to be honest, Brian, you know, I could have done the inner work on myself, made myself better, and just left my story behind and not share it. I don't share all the details. I share enough of the details that are needed and when they're appropriate. And the reason being is uh, when, when you talked about LinkedIn and we met on LinkedIn, uh, I, I always tell this story. So I got on LinkedIn in June of 2009. It's really odd that I know the exact month and year because I was leaving one company that I worked at for 20 years. I brought in a competitor in town and I wanted everybody to know, hey, I'm working for X now, 2009. When I stepped away from corporate in 2018, I thought, hmm, I think I have a LinkedIn account. And I did. I had a nine-year-old LinkedIn account with one post. <laughs> and, and that was it. So a, um, a LinkedIn guru reached out to me and said, well, your post, your, you know, your profile needs help. And I'm like, you think? Yeah. Um, and, and I had to get comfortable with, I have a story and I have a voice. And if it helps just one person. I want to put that out there. And so you talk about intentional encouragement. I, I use the word empowerment. Uh, it, it's the same thing. I, I, it's important that we share, that we let others see and understand that, you know, somebody else has been through this and they found their way back. And if we can help just one person and, and it's a ripple. I mean, I always see that, you know, you throw a pebble and the way the rings ripple out. That's how we make change. That's how we make positive change. Yeah. Yes, I'm that's with you on that. A, yeah, that's 100% correct. So you shared just a minute ago, you, you, you beautifully led, because the last two questions that I typically ask on every podcast is share your biggest obstacle with me and the lesson you learned. And I think you did that beautifully. Share with the audience your biggest piece of intentional encouragement. It's never too late to reset your life. It's never too late. I let people know that all the time. If, if I could have a successful career, if I could look happy on the outside and still be struggling on the inside, and I could have, as you call the V8 moment, that aha moment, and I could turn my inner thinking around, anybody, anybody can do it because I'm not special. So don't ever think that you're stuck in a position and you're unhappy and you just have to stay there till you retire. No, don't ever think that you have to settle for less than, no. It is never too late to push the reset button. Well, you are special, you are brilliant, <laughs> and I have enjoyed this conversation. Tell folks how they can connect with you on other platforms, how they can find your podcast, this is yes. your this is your moment to shamelessly plug whatever you want to shamelessly plug. Well, I will shamelessly plug. So the name of my company is Kimberly Hambrick Consulting. So you know my name, you can find me. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, as Brian said, at Kimberly Hambrick. And I'm on other social platforms, but usually LinkedIn is where I connect with business. And my podcast is The Cannoli Coach. I mean, you Google The Cannoli Coach, you're going to find it. And... Brian, you might have more intention behind how you created your podcast, but I just need to keep it real and share my story because you're going to be a guest. So you may, you know, not want to be after you hear the story, but I step out of corporate. I'm a leadership coach. I'm with the John Maxwell team. I did not want to be doing work in education where my whole career was because everybody in education knew me as the person who brought in federal dollars. I'm good but they never had to pay for it. So now I'm gonna go and say, hey, I'm here, I'm good. Now you have yeah. to pay for me. So I wanted to make a shift. And as I was thinking about how I could brand myself differently, I was mowing grass and I had this, usually a goofy idea, that's where a lot of mine start. Well, I'm Italian, I'm the cannoli coach. And then I shamelessly butchered the line from The Godfather. And my tagline for my podcast is, leave the frustration, take the cannoli. And what the whole podcast is about is sharing stories. People share their stories about what they've been through, what they've worked through, and now where they're at. And, and so that's me. Um, but I will tell you somebody that I worked in corporate for 
20 years when the podcast was released, reached out to me and I got one of those texts and the text was, hey, we're all worried about you. And I'm like, oh, we're all worried about me. And I was sitting here thinking, I haven't worked with you for six months, now you're worried. And I'm like, why are you worried? And they said the cannoli coach. And I was all excited about it. And then the light bulb went off. I said, you do understand that that's a podcast, that when I do work with clients, Mm -hmm. I'm not marketing myself as the cannoli coach. (laughs) Yeah, we're not selling cannolis. Because I asked you, I reached out to you and I said, so where does one get a good cannoli in Winfield? Because I like I like cannolis. I'll have to make you one because you can't get them in Winfield. You Well, I think you can get them in Barbersville. There's a place called, um, on, and the name escapes me, I can see oh, it. Oh, it's the Italian restaurant where all the tables are close together. And yeah. it's, like, it's like sitting in someone's family home. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Rocco's. Rock, well, Rocco's, you can get a good one. Um, but there, there is, and I can't believe that that I cannot think of that, and and now I am live googling on our podcast <laughs> Italian restaurants in Barbersville, West Virginia, and I, it, it will come to me. I think you can get one there at at this restaurant because you can get all kinds of desserts and things like that. Because the people are say Olive Garden and Fratelli's. For, how did I forget Fratelli's? Yeah, that's so funny. No, you know, I, I am a cannoli snob, I will admit. I am too. Um, I like a good cannoli. And they have to have chocolate chips. Don't put that dried fruit in anything. Don't pass off dried fruit. Heavens as... no. So when we we do finally get together, I'll have to, to find cannolis and bring them. We'll just share them over a, a cup of coffee or something. But the Cannoli yeah. Coach podcast, you can find that. And uh, this has been so much fun. I have enjoyed our conversation today on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Kimberly, thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you. And I'm looking forward to part two when you get to be my guest on the cannoli coach. Well, you buckle up. It it, it may get, (laughs) it may get a little, it may get a little bumpy or something, but you know, this has been great. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining me on the Intentional Encourager podcast. My thanks as always to producer Bryce Sexton and technical advisor Matt Meads. And the ultimate thanks goes to the Lord Jesus Christ who provides intentional encouragement every day through his word. And until next time, remember, everyone, everywhere, at any time, and any place, can be an intentional.